You're watching this video on a screen that depicts a seemingly continuous picture. This is, however, just an illusion. If you look closer at the screen, you'll see it's made of tiny individual pixels. But from a distance, this collection of pixels appears as a continuous picture. This is analogous to how our universe appears classical and continuous, but is fundamentally quantum. It's made of discrete chunks of energy, as Max Planck famously showed in 1900. Thanks to him, we have this famous equation, where E, for example, is the energy of a photon, F is the frequency of the light wave, and H is the proportionality constant that relates these two properties. This equation might look simple, but it tells us something profound about nature. It shows how a particle represented by the energy it carries is really just a wave packet. Planck's constant, H, is like the resolution of this packet of energy. It represents the smallest amount of energy that any given frequency of waves can carry. But how can a particle be a wave? What does this mean? And what makes us so sure that this is the case? That's coming up right now. Before we go further, I'd like to recommend a documentary on Magellan TV called Let There Be Life. And here's the part you'll love. To show their appreciation for Arvin Ash viewers, Magellan TV is offering this documentary on Freeview for the next seven days. This means that even if you don't currently have a Magellan TV membership, you'll still be able to stream Let There Be Life absolutely free for the next seven days starting today. This documentary demonstrates how the weirdness of quantum mechanics that I talk about in this video, like the uncertainty principle, impacts the natural world and many aspects of biology. The link to this is in the description. You'll find this and thousands of other fascinating documentaries on Magellan TV. It's a new kind of documentary service from the filmmakers themselves. Featured subjects include history, nature, science, and technology. You can watch it on any of your devices anytime without ads. And while you're watching Let There Be Life on Freeview, consider signing up for Magellan because you'll get a free one month trial too. So you can watch the other thousands of documentaries as well. So be sure to take advantage of this. The links are in the description. By the end of 1905, we had two big equations in physics. Planck's energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency, and Einstein's equation from special relativity. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. A young physicist by the name of Louis de Broglie, who happened to be working on his PhD thesis and was searching for a thesis topic, looked at these two equations and combined them. mc squared equals hf. Since c and h are constants, if we ignore them in the equation for a moment, it simplifies to m equals f. Mass is essentially equal to frequency. A simple high school algebraic manipulation of the equation yielded something quite profound, and eventually a Nobel Prize for de Broglie. But this is weird because mass and frequency are properties of two completely different kinds of things. Mass is associated with discrete objects. Frequency, on the other hand, is associated with a wave. An object is like a basketball. We know where it is. We can bounce it around. If we don't bounce it, it will still be there. A wave, on the other hand, like water waves and sound waves, can disappear. But the water and air will still be there even if the wave is no longer there. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, seems to be indicating something quite different. It seems to be saying that the particle is not only a particle, but is also a wave. They are not separate. What is doing the waving? It's bizarre because nothing is doing the waving. The wave is the particle. The particle is the wave. If the wave disappears, then we don't have what we call a particle anymore. It simply ceases to exist. But how is this possible? How can particles be waves? How can we say that this is correct? Just because our math seems to indicate that this is the case, it doesn't mean that this is reality, does it? After all, whenever we observe anything or measure anything, it always shows up as a particle with discrete qualities like charge or spin or mass. When we observe particles in a cloud chamber, they seem to show up as discrete particles too, not waves. So how can physicists say that a particle is a wave? Surely this can't be true, or can it? This is where the double slit experiment comes in. The original experiment done by Thomas Young in 1800 showed the wave nature of light. When a light source with the same optical wavelength or monochromatic light is projected through two slits onto a screen in the back, it makes an interference pattern. This is caused by constructive and destructive interference of the light waves. 
The bright spots are due to two wave peaks adding to the brightness, and the dark spots are caused by the peak of one wave canceling out the trough of the other. This is not unusual because it is what we would expect a wave to do. It indicates that light is a wave. But from Planck and Einstein, we learned that light comes in discrete packets of energy, called a photon. So is a photon a wave or a particle? Scientists tried to figure this out by shooting one photon at a time through the two slits. If it was a particle like a grain of sand, we would expect it to go through one slit or the other and make a spot on the screen either behind the first slit or the second slit. But this is not quite what happened. The photon seems to randomly make a spot somewhere on the screen. And if we shoot many thousands of photons one at a time, we see that as a whole, the photons make an interference pattern, just as in the original Young experiment. The photons, even though they were shot one at a time, so had no chance to interfere with each other, seem to make an interference pattern as if they interfered. Each photon contributes one dot to the overall interference pattern. This is weird. Could it be that each photon somehow splits into two and interferes with itself before reaching the screen? To test whether that's what's happening, we can put a detector near one of the slits to see if the photon goes through that slit or not. And sure enough, the detector tells us that the photon went through only one or the other of the slits. But wouldn't you know it, when the detector tells us that, the interference pattern disappears. And what we end up with is two patterns on the screen, just like what we would expect from a non-quantum particle, like a grain of sand. What happens if we turn off the detector? Well, then the interference pattern returns. But maybe photons are special. They're just weird things. Surely, other objects like electrons, atoms, and molecules don't behave the same way, right? Wrong. These and any other quantum objects behave exactly the same way. What this experiment suggests is that photons and quantum objects show characteristics of both particles and waves, the wave-particle duality of matter. And it also suggests that the act of measuring the object has a profound effect on the quantum system. Why did it change when we measured it? What caused this change to occur? This is the famous measurement problem in physics. There is no definitive answer. Decoherence has been used to understand apparent wave function collapse. And I have a video on this if you want to see it and learn more about it. But decoherence doesn't generate actual wave function collapse by itself. We know a big change happens upon measurement, but not quite why it happens. I just mentioned the wave function. What does this mean? To understand this, let's compare quantum mechanics to Newtonian mechanics. For Newtonian mechanics, the primary equation is F equals ma. Force equals mass times acceleration. But acceleration can also be written as the second time derivative of position like this. This is the equation of motion in classical mechanics. If we solve this for a particle's position, we can find several things about it, such as its velocity, kinetic energy, etc. So for example, if I know the initial position, velocity, and all the forces acting on a basketball, I can tell you its exact position at a later time. The equivalent primary equation for quantum mechanics is the Schrodinger equation. In this equation, instead of solving for the particle's position, we need to solve it for something quite unique, and that is psi, which is called the wave function. It's called this because it has similarities to waves that we find in classical mechanics. The difference is, there is nothing that's doing the actual waving. The entire quantum object can be described as wave-like. Although this equation looks complicated, it's really just a statement of energy conservation. Total energy, represented on the left side, equals the kinetic energy plus potential energy on the right-hand side. Now, what is psi, the wave function? It's a mathematical expression that represents the state of the quantum system. It's related to the probability of finding the particle in a particular position. Specifically, the square of the norm of the wave function gives you the probability density of the particle. In other words, when you solve the Schrodinger equation for a particle in a specific physical context like position, you don't get a specific value for position like we would with Newtonian mechanics. So I can't tell you where the particle will be I can only tell you the probability of where you might find it if you were to measure it. So quantum objects are kind of 
smeared across space. They are ambiguous. They are not like little ball that we can point to and say, it's there and it's moving this fast. You might ask, well, what else behaves like this? The answer, truth be told, is that all matter behaves like this, including things like basketballs, and even your body is like this. But if that's the case, then why don't basketballs behave the way electrons do, or atoms do, like waves smeared across space? Or let's take something very small, like a grain of sand. Why don't they behave like this? The answer is because the wave behavior of objects that we can see with our eyes, like sand grains or even dust particles, is so small that we do not notice it. You have to realize the scales that our macro objects occupy. An atom is on the scale of one billionth of a meter. Even the tiniest grain of sand that we can barely see would be 100,000 times bigger than that. At this scale, we can't see its wave-like behavior. To understand why, let's go back to Bois, whom I talked about at the start. He believed particles and waves had the same trait, and he derived an equation that describes the wavelength of any particle. This is called the Bois wavelength. How did he come up with this? Using the original equality, mc squared equals hf, we can substitute v for c, velocity for the speed of light. Then we get that f equals mv squared over h. And then, using the relationship v or velocity is equal to wavelength times frequency, we get that the wavelength, lambda, is equal to h, Planck's constant, over mass times velocity, which is also momentum. Using this relationship, we can find the wavelength of any particle. So for example, when we plug in the numbers for an electron in a hydrogen atom, we find that its wavelength is about 3.3 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. An atom has a radius of about 10 to the negative 10 meters. So its electron has a de Bois wavelength of about the size of an atom. This makes sense because we know that an electron is somewhere in a cloud around the nucleus. And since the orbit of the electron makes the size of the atom, this fits with our model. Its quantumness is apparent. But you'll notice that since m, the mass, is in the denominator, for very massive objects, even small things that we can barely see with our eyes, the wavelength becomes extremely small. So for example, the wavelength of a very small grain of sand moving about 10 meters per second would be about 10 to the negative 25 meters. And for large things like a basketball, the wavelength would be even smaller, 10 to the negative 34 meters. This is extremely small, 24 orders of magnitude smaller than that of the electron. To give you an idea of how small this is, the size of a proton is about 10 to the negative 15 meters. So the wavelength of a grain of sand we can barely see would be billions of times smaller than that. This is not measurable. Even one of our most sensitive instruments, the LIGO detector that detects gravitational waves, could not detect this. A wavelength is about one quantum of action. The smaller the wavelength, the less quantum-like the object is. If the wavelength becomes extremely small, any action of that object appears to be continuous and smooth. This is why we don't notice any weird behavior in macro-scale objects. The smaller the wavelength, the lower the waviness or quantumness of the object becomes. This is why particles with large wavelengths, compared to their size, like electrons, photons, and other quantum objects, exhibit wave-like and thus quantum-like behavior. This calls into question, what exactly is a particle? For that matter, what is matter? I'll have more on this in the next video, but for now, let me leave you with this teaser. There are no particles. Everything is a wave, specifically a wave in a quantum field. Electrons and all other fundamental particles are a wave or excitation in this field. The de Bois wavelength of the particle is the wavelength of these waves in the field. Don't miss my next video. Until next time, my friend.